Well, here we are. It is uh, Wednesday, February 15th, 2023. And as I've mentioned several times in the last few weeks, that uh, this, there's going to be a series of auctions coming up in New York in March, some very good ones. And in particular, uh, and it's been getting a lot of interest, is the sale of the uh, inventory and library of Jim Lally. He owned J and J Lally Company uh, in New York for uh, well, starting in the '80s. He just closed it a couple of years ago. He decided to step back from running a day-to-day -day shop and uh, get into uh, other things. I guess is what it amounts to. And uh, the catalog uh, that was published on Christie's is now up on the uh, in the reference section on on over at Bitamount. Uh, go to the little red box here, click it down, it opens it, and it'll be the first catalog here. It's a very attractive, uh, nice blue covered uh, 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 book uh, with, with every all the lots in it. And what's interesting about it is in the back of the book, there's two sections to the sale. Um, there's the port pottery and ceramics, and then there is in the back of the book the online stuff, which is the the reference library, which we're going to get to, which is pretty amazing. But if you uh, if you go through the catalog and you get to the back end of it, you'll you'll see the uh, uh, lot numbers and so forth for the for the library. We'll get to it here. Let's see here. Where is there? It is there. Are the books. All right, and they're all in there. Amazing uh, books, some great, great books. We're going to talk about just a few of them. Some of them are in Chinese uh, only, and others are uh, in English. But uh, as you, he owned a, a massive library. I don't think he's selling his entire library. I can't imagine anybody doing that, but he's selling a lot of it. And um, it'll be fun to see uh, how it does. Um, uh, and if you're if you're if you're a collector and you're at all serious, you should really look at the books. Books are essential to to to, to learning about this topic. And uh, Jim Lally uh, obviously would have very good reference books. So uh, you know, take it from that standpoint. Um, the uh, Christie sale is posted over here on the global member pages. It's all set up and linked. And the catalog, as I said, is on the front end of the uh, website itself. And the Bonham sale is also um, on the uh, global member pages. Bonham's got some of the material and Christie's got some of the material. They sort of split it. Uh, the Bonham stuff is, is, is going to be the less expensive, but some really interesting things, but with lower estimates, something that may, you know the average collector could probably participate in and get some nice items for himself. And uh, as, as with all of Lally's stuff, um, they're, they're very fine. You're going to see that they, he emphasized heavily researched, well-documented items with good provenances whenever possible. And, uh, and then he offered prime examples to his clients is, was how he, how he was so successful for so long. Did a lot of business with uh, museums and institutions and so forth over his career. And at the beginning of the catalog, which is really interesting, um, there is a, a nice biography of uh, Jim going back to when he started his business he had been the president of Sotheby's. He had been instrumental with Julian Thompson in establishing uh, Sotheby's um, at the time uh, as, a, as a major player in the Asian art market in Hong Kong. And uh, I'm a little, I don't know why, I, I was a little surprised to see that he was having Christie sell his stuff, but he's been gone from Sotheby so long, I guess he, he picked the one that he felt was best for him. And, and that's always the decision you have to make. Any, any, and every smart dealer will know that. Um, here's an article that they reprinted from the Herald Tribune from 1987 about, uh, about Jim and how he, he left uh, uh, Sotheby's to open his own store and why he did. And there's some very interesting photographs. There's a nice picture of him here with Julian Thompson from back in, uh, when was this taken? 1974, way back then. There's, this is Julian on the right, and that's Jim Lally when he was a younger man. And in here, they have a list of the museums that he sold things to. And uh, it's basically all the best museums in the world. There they all are. And he has sold, you know, some of these institutions he sold multiple things to um, during his long career and uh, so forth. He was highly regarded in, 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 in certain areas especially. And we're going to get into some of the items and talk a little bit about it. His, his taste was impeccable, is impeccable. And um, he's very good. And incidentally, if you if you want to see him give some lectures here on YouTube, and I'll try to find it, and I'll put the link in below this video. Um, he did a number of um, uh, very good uh, lectures on Sung Ceramics and so forth. And uh, he, he's a really good speaker. He's really fun to listen to. And he tells some great tales of early collections and so forth. Um, it, it's, it's, it's worth the time. I think one of them is about an hour and a half long. It is, a, or an hour or so. It's really good, really, really good uh, lecture. All right, so getting into the sale, here it is. 
And it starts out with some nice bronzes and then moves through uh, into other metalworks. He was a big fan of, of early metalworks, Tang metalwork, Han metalwork, and so forth, Tang pottery. And then you get into the real meat of the things that some of the things that he seems to be most well known for, um, not exclusively, of course, but but one of his big emphasis: uh, five dynasties, Tang ware, white wares, Sung pieces, northern and southern Sung pieces, and so forth. He did repeated uh, uh, shows and exhibitions of private collections over his career. Um, he bought many, many pieces for his inventory and so forth. And these are just some of the examples we're going to take a quick look at. I'm not going to go through all of them. There are too many. But uh, you can see that the, he had, there was a certain flavor to what, what he was a, a fan of and what he preferred to deal in. And, and you're looking at them right here. Um, lots of monochromes. He loved monochromes. Still does, I assume. And uh, that was a, a big chunk of his inventory, regardless of period. And scholars' objects, uh, mirrors, a few jades, and so forth. So let's let's have a look and see what, what he's got. The first thing up, uh, this is, and there's two of these dishes, these uh, chrysanthemum dishes done during the Yongshen period. They get big estimates, two to 300,000. They were made, uh, they made these in, in 12 different colors. There's, there's this one, and then there's this one. And uh, this is a purple uh, enameled example, which is pretty rare. Um, and, and they're both estimated at two to $300,000. Uh, like I said, they, were, they made these in 12 different colors for the, for the uh, uh, Yongshan court, uh, the Bauer collection. There, there, are, there are other examples floating around in the art world. All of them are highly cherished. All of them are in major museums. This one he bought in, um, uh, he bought at Christie's in Hong Kong in 1998. He apparently hung on to it for some reason. Maybe he just liked it a lot. And there's a, a little bit of a write-up on there on these pieces. But that, that's that's sort of the, uh, some of the highlights of the Qing words. He has other Qing ceramics, also monochromes that will be in the sale. And there's a couple of Famille Rose examples. And then this, whoop, get back up to this is this uh, Dun Xi Ping um, a gallbladder form uh, uh, bottle vase done during the Song, Southern Song Dynasty. And the, these guanwares are extremely rare. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, this one is just five inches tall, superbly done. And uh, these, were, these were made for the imperial court. The, and, 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 and some of these, are, there's influence, obviously, on Rueware. They have a nice bluish tone, but they're a little darker than Rueware. There's a fine crackle in them. And uh, the, the, very few of these survived because when they were making these, they had to be fired up to, you know, up to five times. They kept putting new layers of glaze on and then refiring and refiring. And, of course, when you refire something, uh, every time you refire, you run the risk of losing, the, losing a piece. Uh, so after five firings to get this perfect glaze, um, uh, in the end, you don't have that many that survive. And this one um, is a good picture of the bottom. And uh, you'll notice this sticker on here that says CK. And that's Carl Kempe. And he was a major Swedish collector um, uh, who passed away in the 1960s. I think he died in 1967. And um, over the years, um, uh, if you've been collecting at all, you've probably, uh, in collecting good things, you've probably had something with this st with one of his collection stickers on it. He had a massive collection. I've, I've had the good fortune of, of buying and selling several things that had been in his collection that had been cataloged over the years. And uh, this is, this is I didn't have anything quite this rare, but uh, uh, this is a, a really great example. And uh, you'll notice uh, one of the differences between this and Rue Ware is this very dark brown paper body underneath it's a bit darker than uh, the rue examples it's estimated at 700 to 900 thousand dollars it's as i said it's five and one eighth inches tall it has its uh, japanese lacquer box apparently this came out of a japanese collection at some point uh, but it, just a, a great example and then over to this if you're a dewa or blanc de sheen collector um, you might want to look at this and this is this is has a, has a fairly modest estimate eight to twelve thousand dollars but this is an extremely rare um, form of uh, a Blanc de Chine, or De Wa, uh, these Chilong vases. Um, there's one in the uh, David collection. Um, there's one in the Bauer collection, I believe. And, and there, are, there are others around, but not many. They're very, very unusual, um, highly desirable. This one has a beautiful, beautifully potted 
uh, and they've provided some nice photographs. And here's a, a, an image of the bottom. You can get a good look at the uh, the base on it to see what the foot rim on this thing should look like, and so forth. They had tag, like the old tag on it, and they had mistagged it as Ming Dynasty. And they now know that uh, the, these pieces were probably Kangxi period, and that's the generally accepted uh, age on it. And uh, it's got a good provenance. It was sold by um, uh, Ralph Ralph Jate Gallery. Um, in New York, and then the estate of uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. D. D. Neeland, who I'm not familiar with. Then it was in a private collection, and then it was in Jim Lally's in Jim Lally's uh, uh, collection. Um, and it is uh, how tall is this? Eight and a half inches tall. It looks like it's in wonderful condition, and I think that estimate is very reasonable for a rarity like this. Uh, but I would, I, if you're a Blanc de Chine or an interested Blanc de Chine, and you buy anything this year, this is something you might consider buying. Um, a very, very unusual example. It could go over the estimate. All of these things, of course, could. Uh, a lot of people are going to be excited uh, to bid in the sale because of the provenance of the history and the legacy. Excuse me, I was interrupted by a phone call. And the legacy of, of Jim Lally and uh, all, all that he has done, um, the, the power of the provenance, uh, it, it will be a, a provenance will be a, a big effect here on a lot of these lots. Uh, because it, because many of these pieces were exhibited and um, uh, published and so forth by him, promoted, and uh, you know they're instantly recognizable. And then over to this, this Zun vase. This is a, a fantastic um, Langyao baluster vase, Kangxi period. It's pretty big. It's about 18 inches tall, but it has superb color. The coloration on this is just absolutely, it, this piece just glows. And if you pull it in and you come over and take some time to study it, um, the, the, the shading of the uh, uh, copper red uh, on this piece, the, the, the way it flows down the gloss at the bottom, it, it's, just, it's just a beautiful example and it looks to be in outstanding condition. Um, there's a picture of the foot rim on the bottom and so forth. Um, beautifully done that fine crackle that you often see on the bottoms of these kung shi pieces sometimes it has a little bit of a greenish tinge to it and sometimes it's this color uh but, but just a beautiful beautiful uh, display here of that nice wonderful kung shi white paste very very pure and beautifully potted on this nice stand it's 17 and a half inches tall um um and uh on a gilt metal stand it's beautifully done estimated at 120 to 180 thousand dollars all right, and then over to this, another very great rarity. And this is a, a Kung Shi period, Claire de Lune, uh, they're known as rib jars, 100 rib jars. And this particular color was really, uh, the Claire de Lune during the Kung Shi period was, was a, this tone, was this, this shade of blue, this Claire de Lune blue, was really reserved for the imperial house only. This was the imperial color, uh, and, and they made these fantastically refined uh, examples like this, these rib jars. Many of you, if you've been collecting for any length of time, you've seen them before. They've made a few of them, but they didn't make a lot of them. They're, 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 the last one that came up for auction, as a matter of fact, for some reason, I remember it was at Sotheby's or Christie's, it didn't sell. And I don't know why. Uh, the, maybe the estimate was too high, or who knows. Uh, but this is another example. It's extremely well done. The potting on this is absolutely outstanding. Um, there's a good shot of the bottom, that beautiful flat, uh, flat bottom. And if you ran your, were able to run your fingers over this, it would be just as, as this edge here, just as smooth as glass. And you can see the, the the rub line here around the outside. And this is where the the bottom of this is slightly concave. But the foot here, where it touches, where it would be touching the surface all those years, you can see how polished white it is from, from being in contact with a stand or a table for the last 300 or so years. Uh, but but a, a stellar example all the way through, estimated at four to six hundred thousand dollars. And then on to this. This is this is a very interesting piece of jade. If you're a jade buyer, you want to look at this. This is a, a 17th or 18th century uh, jade box. And it, it, it has an interesting prior ownership, but it's a big box. This box is, I think it's 10 inches, 10 inches in length, which is very, very large for one of these. And uh, if you pull it in, the carving on it is outstanding. It was carved out of a, of a single a single boulder, and it's got uh, uh, peaches and bats, all auspicious peaches and bats, a ring in it and so forth with these um, uh, russet inclusions. It's just a, a glorious example. That's all there is to say about it. It's estimated at two to $400,000, but the provenance on it is also very interesting. It was sold by Spink and Sons to Dr. Harold Peach Peisch, 
Um, he, he and his wife were avid collectors of Asian art starting in the 1950s. It started with actually he inherited some pieces and he became interested in it. He decided to go out and do some research and learn about it. And he became very friendly with the, the folks at Spinx. And he bought almost exclusively from Spinx or he used them as his advisor throughout his collecting career. Um, and one of the first, this is the first piece of jade that he bought, uh, which is, I don't know, where do you go from there? You know, you buy, you buy like one of the best pieces you're ever going to see, you know, out of the ballpark uh, item. And um, now it's uh, now it's up for sale again. So if you want to try to take a shot at it, you can. Uh, the estimate on it is pretty big, three to four hundred thousand dollars. But it is a stupendous example. It's really, really fine example. And I'm, I'm just going to be fascinated to see what these things bring because because the estimates are, are strong, but are they crazy? Um, or are people going to step up and, and want a piece of this collection? And then you, over here, you have this in, a rare imperial glass bronze ritual bell. Um, uh, Bian Zhong, they were called. This was done during the Kangxi period. And uh, the form originates actually out of the Western Zhao era um, uh, in, in line with con, uh, the Confucius uh, mode, so to speak, where uh, every ceremony began with music. And um, these, these, these bells were made, these bronze bells were made in, in, in uh, uh, different sizes, descending sizes. And uh, usually they were displayed in a group of 16 at a time on a giant wooden rack it would be on the wall, there'd be two tiers. And the person would, would play them like a xylophone, basically. They, they, but they had two tiers of these bells, and they would ring them um, uh, to go to go with the ceremony. And, and you've seen them; uh, they are very desirable. This one is in outstanding condition; has beautiful trigrams all over it, and these beautiful bosses. But the casting of the uh, the, the dragons on top is absolutely stu superb. Um, I've seen some, you see, sometimes you see them, they're not this well done. This one is very refined, very finely done. Um, and uh, what's the estimate on this? The estimate on this is also four to 600,000. It's a foot tall. Um, some were bigger than these, some were a little bit smaller, but it's a very, very uh, rare bird in the in the collecting world, in, in, in the Kangxi bronze. And it's dated um, um, inscription to 1713. So to, uh, toward the last years of the Kangxi period, this was made. And then you get over to this, this uh, very fine um, uh, uh, Sung. This is a Sung bowl. Uh, let's see here. Northern Sung to Jin Dynasty marbled bowl. And uh, these are fascinating uh, because the technique of doing this work really began, the first pieces were done in the Tang Dynasty. And um, over the years, they sort, of, it, they, they, they sort of went out of fashion because they were very hard to make. And um, what they think the design came from, this technique came from Middle Eastern glassware. Um, uh, where they layered glass and got this effect using glass. And, and, and they believe that the uh, Tang potters saw some of this glass, Middle Eastern glass, Afghanistan glass, and thought, ah, maybe we can do this in ceramics. So that's what they did here. And this is a glorious looking thing. I love that. It's almost hypnotic to look at it. It's beautifully done. And this isn't the most, there's another one in the set, in the auction that actually has a higher estimate. I happen, I just like this one better. Um, because it, it's it's very it's very complicated. <laughs> I just I happen to like the, the feeling of it. Um, it's estimated at eight to twelve thousand dollars, but it, it is a great thing. It's a fabulous thing. It's a little over just a hair over five inches in diameter. It's good size. And then over to this, a really rare. We, a Fei Wildware was made. A lot of it was made in, in the um, in the 16th century. This is a, a late 15th century example, either Chen Hua or Hongxi period, uh, but very refined. This is an extremely fine piece of Fei Hua ware. Uh, the, the, the colors are beautiful. The glaze looks nearly perfect. You don't see the, a lot of the later um, um, Ming examples that was, that was, had a problem with flaking and chipping off the pieces. This doesn't have any of that from what I can see. And uh, they, they've provided some very nice shots of it all the way around. Here's a picture of the bottom, um, what it should look like. Uh, you've got little bits of dirt and debris on there, but that's that's the original base in that very, again, you have that very nice smooth foot from resting on surfaces for five or 600 years or so, 700 years. It is seven and a quarter inches tall. It was bought from a collection. He, he bought this at a private uh, French collection at the uh, Hotel Drouot back in 2011. Um, and he's had it ever since, estimated at two to three hundred thousand uh, dollars. It is an imperial felwa jar. It's beautiful, 
and uh, there's a good there's a bit of an essay on it here at the bottom uh, that you can go and read all about Fawa and the palette and how they made them and how they laid the clay on and how they carved them and glazed them and so forth. Um, very very good article, and it was uh, written by Rosemary Scott, who always does. She's one of the great researchers in the world when it comes to catalog entries. And she's right up there. And then over to this, this very nice uh, tripod food bronze, a Ding from the Shang Dynasty to the Anyang period, 12th to 13th century BC. But it has a beautiful patina on it. The surface on this bronze is just wonderful. There it is. It's all very tight. It's not flaking. Um, you, you can see the relief work very, very clearly. It's in really wonderful condition. Um, all the way around. Uh, they've provided a few pictures of it. Oh, there's a video of it coming up. There it is. Uh, really, really attractive color. And, and this, this shade of green, this grayish green, is, is one of the colors that bronze fans really go after um, when, it, when it forms naturally. There's a good shot of it right there. Beautiful example. Love the pinwheels on it. Love the archaic masks and so forth. And it's estimated at eighty to hundred thousand dollars. I suspect it'll get there. Um, I don't know why it wouldn't. Uh, we've seen these in the past sell for um, considerably more than that. I think I, for some reason this estimate seems very, very uh, uh, a little on the soft side to me. Maybe to encourage competition for it. I don't know. And then on to this five dynasties to northern Song. This is one of my favorite things in the sale. The very unusual you sell it on um, uh, 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 ewer with its bowl. And uh, this is a very unusual form. Many of you have seen these uh, 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 cup and uh, ewer and bowl samples before, um, you know, especially from the Sung Dynasty and so forth. They even did some in Korea. Um, but th this one is a stupendous example. It's very powerful, stoutly potted, large dome lid, you know, very, very uh, beautifully incised, decorated uh, all over the body. Uh, nice, strong handle, beautifully proportioned spout. All the way up, this this has everything going for it that you'd want to see, and it is estimated at 120 to 150 thousand dollars, which is a which is a, a big estimate for a, a piece from this period, in a way for what it is. But it's a very rare form, um, and it, it has a very powerful presence to it. It's not enormous in size; it's seven inches tall. Um, the um, uh, the ewer is seven and three quarter inches, and then add another inch or so for being in the bowl. So that you're looking at something that's going to be eight or nine inches tall, but a very refined example, beautiful colored glaze, and um, important, important collectible thing. And this was must have been a little difficult to photograph. This is a russet painted black and glazed pillow. Uh, it was made during the Northern Song to again to the Jin Dynasty. <clears throat> but what's unusual about this is, is well, the whole thing is unusual because it's the glaze, the red, is absolutely beautiful. But it's on a very unusual lotus uh, stand, almost like the stand you see underneath um, uh, bronzes. Um, and it's this wasted uh, uh, support underneath it. Very unusual. And in, in the, in the write-up in the essay, they actually said it might even be unique. Um, so they couldn't cite a, a, another example quite like this one. Uh, but the, the, the decoration on it is just outstanding all the way around. Here's the, here's the top of it. Beautifully painted with that iron brown um, uh, into the glaze. Nicely done. And uh, do they show a picture of the bottom of it? No, they just show the different sides of it. And uh, it's got a pretty big estimate. It's estimated at twelve to 18000 which is a little high sometimes for some of these pillows. But the color is so rare. Um, the white ones are, you know, eight to twelve thousand, eight to 15, ten to fifteen thousand. This one's twelve to eighteen thousand, and it doesn't seem unreasonable to me at all. There's not a lot of history on it. It just says Jim Lally Company, New York. So he probably bought it from a private collector and wanted it just left right there, which does happen. Not every collector that sells something wants his name broadcast after he's sold it. Uh, often because they want to be left alone, they want to, don't want people calling them up seeing if they've got anything else. And then this, there's another piece of uh, uh, five dynasties to Northern Sung, this beautiful white uh, gourd-shaped ewer, uh, but just snow white, beautiful white creamy body on this thing. It's nine inches tall. Um, and if you, if you pull this in, this is one of these really great examples from the period uh, that's just superbly painted, it, uh, and a, a, a glazed rather. It almost looks new. And when you look at this, it's hard to believe uh, it, it's that old, that it's a thousand years old. This is just a look at this nice little decoration they put around the around the rim of the spout and the little details, the ribbing here, and then just a beautiful, even creamy glaze down to this very delicate foot. Lovely example. Um, 
And he's got a bunch of white wares in here like this. It's estimated at thirty to 50000 but again, rare and perfect. Same goes for this Yu Zhao Celadon uh, tripod sensor, um, Sung to Jin Dynasty. Uh, I just, uh, this is very, very nice. Um, and and they, made, they made somewhat similar examples later, but this is an early one. This is an early one. The, the lion masks of, of feet on it are beautiful. The, uh, the decoration, the relief work off it is perfect. The glaze is exceptional. The color is that nice, light, soft, so almost like a soft celadon uh, or soft uh, celery color. Uh, estimated at fifty to seventy thousand dollars, and uh, the only provenance again is just Jim Lally. There's a very brief write-up on it, but it's a rare bird. These are pretty rare, um, so check that out. And then you get back into this a very serious um, uh, ding lotus carved ding lotus bowl. Um, this is a really really fine one, and uh, if you take the time to pull it in, you'll you'll see how how it, how, how powerfully. Uh, decorated this thing is the way it was incised it's got a copper rim on it with pinched these little pinched edges going around it the copper rims are applied just to protect the, the thing from being banged and chipped these are highly valued even in their day they're highly cherished uh, very very refined and they did provide an outstanding image of the bottom because there are a lot of copies of these things on the market the dingware is one of the most copied items out there um, among many I suppose at this point but here's a good picture of the foot rim on it. It was on loan to the Fogg Museum at Harvard, apparently, in 1980, because um, uh, they, they do exhibitions and shows there. Maybe it was done with Mr. Mowry. I'm not sure. If he, I'm not sure if he was there then. I think he was. Bob Mowry? He's, the, he's one of the big scholars on... Uh, he actually wrote some of the essays in this catalog. Uh, he's a scholar, on, on, in particular, on Sung and, and, and wares of that era, in general, going... 300 years up or down that was that's sort of his area and uh, he, he did some of the entries in this um, catalog uh, for what I've seen uh, he's got the full provenance there's a lot of uh, provenance in their previous owners beautiful example and then you get into the book section which uh, is exceptional and this is a separate sale and it's uh, it'll be online and then apparently a live sale at the end and you you'll have to maybe chase things a bit but there's some pretty good books in here uh there's for example the bauer collection a group of six publications from the bauer collection it's not all of them they've done others uh but it, it's a very very they do the best publications uh, that's all i can tell you uh they do great publications they do, do great scholarly research the, the organizations in switzerland it's on they have an online presence uh, and but the Bauer collection is one of the legendary collections of Chinese art in the world and uh, they publish books they do all kinds of uh, scholarly stuff uh, sort of like the way the Chipstown F Foundation used to do a lot with American furniture they still do but it's that, it's that, that level of, of uh, reputation and uh, there's six books uh, in, and they're, worth, they're estimated two to three thousand dollars and that's what they're worth um, these books are worth $500 a piece because that's what, if you look around and you, you, you see what they're being sold for, you see sometimes they're selling for $1,000 a piece or even more. So uh, you may have to chase this lot a little bit if you want the books, but it's certainly a book worth getting. And then you have um, uh, uh, D David uh, Howard and Ayers' uh, two-volume set on China for the West. Famous, famous book. If you don't have it, you should have it. If you're especially interested in China trade, it's estimated at three to $500 U.S., and then over here is a group of 39 publications for $1,000 to $1,500. And uh, in, the, in this lot, though, there are some pretty great books, um, um, uh, especially for, uh, if, if, you're, if you're really uh, building your library. There's some essentials in here that you're really going want to want for it. Um, one is the Jury Tang Collection, 50 Years of the, of the Collection great book and then you have uh, uh, China Without Dragons is another good book and then you have Chinese Ceramics by Harper and Rowe written by Michel Baudelet he was a, a famous French dealer collector um, he wrote some good books and his his big book the one that he's most well known for is this one the Rizzoli book on Qing porcelain uh, a very 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 fine uh, worthwhile thing to go after and then you have other books from um, Rizzoli um, some of them, or, or Hudson and Thames, I guess they are. Hudson and Thames and Rizzoli are very similar. Uh, Ming porcelain, Sung porcelain, and Tang porcelain. And then a, a commemorative uh, exhibition of the Royal Academy in 1935 to 1936. And that was that legendary show that they did in London back then, where they sent in thousands of examples of, uh, uh, of ch uh, Chinese art from around the world and from private collections. Uh, it, was a, it was an absolute... Uh, phenomenon at the time 
And this book has, it's all black and white because I have a copy of it, but it has a lot of images in it. It shows, it shows the show and uh, it's worth having. And the whole lot is, is estimated, all 39, it estimated at 1000 to $1,500, um, which doesn't seem like much money to me. It, it, you're, t you're talking about, you know, 20 or 30, 40 bucks a book. So it's certainly a good deal. And then this, the museum collection, including the Top Capi Sarre Museum uh, book by um, uh, uh, John Ayers. Here it is. Uh, uh, th these two books right here. Well, these three books, rather. The open book and these two. That, that's the famous collection. And that set normally sells for between $900 and $1,500 by itself. And then you have several others in here. All right, so uh, it, 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 it should get up to uh, the two to $3,000 estimate, certainly within range of it by the time they're done. Uh, but the, 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 the uh, Top Copy Sari books are the ones you really, really want to own if you can. And then over on the bottom's end of it, this is a sale that ends on the 20th of March, three days before the, the, the Christie's event takes place. There are a whole bunch of uh, about 68 lots in here of smaller things, lesser, lesser estimated, but all, again, with that lally quality um, um, and, 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 and interesting and well-researched and documented and all that stuff. And, and it's jades, metalworks, and so forth. One of the pieces, uh, lots that caught my eye was this, this pair of cloisonne enamel vases, uh, mark and period Chin Lung. Uh, these are very, very nice. They are 14 and a quarter inches tall, and I think the estimate is awfully low. Um, estimated at six to $8,000, four to six, what was it, four to, six to 8,000. That seems very low to me for these. These are, these are super. Um, a beautiful pair, nice uh, full full saturation colors, the beautiful reds in it, the blues are strong, uh, that uh, lovely uh, sort of amber or yellow uh, that you see on these 18th century pieces. Uh, absolutely superb, and I love I love the way the base is done on this, and their ribbed bodies, but very finely done. And I think the estimate is I think the estimate to me looks way low. It looks it looks like you could almost add a zero onto this, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. Um, but you know, you do have to ask for condition reports and so forth. And here's a picture of the bottom to give you some idea what the bases of these look like. That's what they should look like right there. Notice the wear on the foot. Lots of natural wear from resting on surfaces, and then the then the uh, the mark um, in in perfect condition, five characters, uh, because it, it never touches anything. It's just recessed. It's up in there. And then there's this a group of f four silver and gold Tang to Song Dynasty artifacts, objects, bowls, pins, and that sort of thing. But estimated at twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. Um, and these these are lovely, and, and, and not you know you often think well you know Tang and early metalworks is always so expensive and beyond my grasp. Well, here you have several nice examples, um, perfect for the collector. I like the bowl in particular with the gilded uh, interior, the Vermeer, Vermeer interior. Um, estimated at twelve to fifteen hundred dollars. No, is it going to go for that? Who knows? It may go way over that. But at least you got a shot. You know the estimates under that number. And the same thing goes for these three small, very nicely, beautifully carved agate uh, vessels. And these are Liao to Sung Dynasty examples. Um, and just absolutely beautiful. Love the shape of that bowl in particular. And then you have this faceted, uh, 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 looks like a brush washer. But beautifully done, and then of course this 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 elegant cup that looks it looks like it looks like modern it looks like modern modern stonework, but it's not it's old. <clears throat> and um, that is what was this lot estimated at? I, did I even say um, uh, three to four thousand dollars for these three th four beautiful pieces of carved stone, and then a, fang, a pair of Fang Hu um, Han Dynasty uh, with gilding uh, bronze vases. Uh, these are sixteen inches tall. Again, very modest estimate, two to three thousand. I think they'll go over that, but at least you got a shot at it. So take the shot. You know, and this is a sale you want to go through and just leave bids in. And then you have this, a really nice suede dynasty covered jar. Uh, it is nine inches in height. It looks bigger uh, because of the way it's potted. It looks like a larger example, but it is a, um, a, a suede dynasty example. You can see a little bit here with some of the some of the glaze was uh, you know it was was pushing through while it was being fired and created this little rundown here. Um, nice crackle, and it, the crackle runs at an angle. You'll notice it almost like it's rotating up the piece. Uh, beautifully done. Uh, the greenish tinge where the glaze is pulled, and it has its lid, which is almost a miracle. These things never have their lids. Estimated at thirty to fifty thousand dollars.
beautiful piece. And then this, the silver archaic uh, seal with the Bixi knob on it. Uh, I love this thing. I think this thing is terrific. Uh, the carving, you, many of you will recognize right away. Um, how big is this thing? What is it? I think it was um, uh, uh, 11, um, 1 and 1 16th inch tall. So it's pretty small. It's about that big. Very small little thing. And it's it, it's a, a Eastern Han uh, to Jin Dynasty example, but you'll recognize it if you're if you're interested in sculpture from this period because it looks an awful lot like stone carvings that you see of of the of the lions from that period with their with their paws sort of outstretched in front of them, recoiling back a little with their head back. That's a, a very typical pose and uh, a beautifully done piece of silver. Really, really lovely. Nice object. It's a great little object. Estimated at four to six thousand dollars, and there are many, many other items in here too. I didn't want to. I don't want to just skip over it. Uh, it's it's really worth going to look at, the, especially if you're a jade buyer and you like small early jades. There's some very nice small early jades in here, and uh, there's some rare forms of uh, 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 little vases and odds and ends. Things things you just don't see very often. I'll tell you. Um, this nice carving of a duck, the preening here. 1800 to 2500 dollars and so forth dating to the 18th or early 19th century and uh, on and on it's just going to be an interesting series of sales i think i think bottoms got some good things now i'd heard somewhere that bottoms was supposed to be getting some books too no maybe at the last minute they gave the those are all the books and they're all going over to um christie's i don't know um but i had heard that bottoms was going to be offering some of the books too and when, if I hear any more on it, I'll, I'll let you know, uh, because there's, he had certainly had enough books to, to, he certainly had enough books to do two sales. Um, uh, you could do 10 sales with his reference library, probably. But uh, if the books appear on here in the next few days, I'll be sure to mention it in the Friday video or in another video uh, covering the auctions that are coming up. Because we're going to be doing probably, I suspect, a few of them, because uh, all the auction houses have something going on. Uh, March, as you know, is traditionally a big time, um, uh, sort of getting this, the year started, so to speak, setting the tone um, for the season. And uh, this is the uh, lolly sale again, just flipping back up through it to give you some some a quick look at things in here. It's just some great things. Um, so we'll 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 follow it on the book side, and when if the books appear, uh, we'll let you know. But uh, that's sort of a, a quick rundown of of the sales. Uh, I think they're excellent. I, th I think it's going to be a very interesting thing. And as we saw when you know when in the past when we've seen other legendary dealers close up shop or retire or pass on, like Ellsworth Collection, you have Jim Lally. Thankfully, he's still among us, and uh, so forth. You you get a lot of interest because people are. Um, uh, uh, friends of these these people, they trusted them. Um, they built their collections around them, uh, around these top dealers. Uh, have, have built up so many great collections, and this is this is sort of like your last shot. Is is, is Jim um, heads out the door uh, with his with, with with some of his items, uh, and uh, we'll see how it does. I, I hope he remains active in the business. It's in some way or writing or doing something. I just hope so. Uh, he's 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 great to uh, listen to. Uh, when he gives talks and so forth. I think he's got a lot that he still wants to do. So anyway, that's it. If you enjoyed the video, leave a comment. Um, subscribe on here on YouTube if you haven't already. We do these videos several times, a couple of times a week. We talk about, uh, we do an end of the week video and so forth. And um, what's been happening uh, on, on different sites, live auctioneers, uh, eBay and so forth. And when the big auction houses have sales coming up or, or other auction houses that have interesting sales, at least um, we, we, we try to talk about them or at least let you know about them. So uh, there we are. All right. Have a great week and we'll be back Friday with the regular video. And thanks for watching. All righty. Bye bye.